Good day. Over the course of this week, on November 16th, the President of the United States, Joe Biden, and the President of the People's Republic of China, Xi Jinping, are due to hold a much-anticipated virtual summit meeting. Now, the United States has been trying to get some kind of meeting organised between Biden and Xi ever since the administration, the new administration, took office back in January. The Chinese have been extremely uh, um, cagey about holding such a summit meeting. They flatly rejected suggestions of an actual formal summit meeting with a physical uh, get-together of the two leaders. And instead, they have, after much persuasion and very hard work on the part of the US authorities, conceded a virtual meeting, which is, as I said, the one that's due to take place between Xi Jinping and Joe Biden. And it will take place on the 16th of November. Now, virtual summits probably are going to become more common over the course of the future, irrespective of what happens to the pandemic. It's entirely understandable that world leaders will find it easier to speak with each other using these new sophisticated means of communication than uh, travelling long distances for physical meetings with each other. But nonetheless, a virtual summit doesn't have quite the same impact on the world as an actual summit does. There's none of the photo ops. There's no opportunity for a joint press conference, something which, by the way, might be actually welcomed by the United States, given President Biden's difficulty in conducting press conferences. And um, it's also um, the case, too, that it's widely acknowledged that an actual physical meeting between two leaders, one in which they can talk to each other directly across the table, and both one-to-one, uh, -one, with their translators, of course, and then separately with their delegations, can often, that those sort of meetings can often be important and useful in establishing a rapport, in getting a full and proper understanding of each other. I would add that from time to time, in some meetings, the world leaders, the two leaders, of um, actually walk off and have private chats with each other. Um, sometimes they go on a walk, just with their translators present, and those sort of discussions which don't, or which, by the way, um, never end and are never expected to end in any actual decisions or agreements. But those sort of, that sort of interchange can be extremely useful. I would add that one advantage of those sort of face-to-face -face meetings and of that walking off, perhaps in a nearby park or garden or outside whatever residence or a uh, building, the actual summit is being held, those sort of one-to-one -one meetings off stage between world leaders have the further benefit that they can take place, hopefully, with, beyond earshot of microphones and without all the people, all the various officials and intelligence agencies listening in to every word that is said. Of course, in a virtual meeting, that is impossible. There is no opportunity for one-to-one -one discussions. There's no opportunity for brief walks out of the building and a sort of exchange of views and opinions and a real get-to-know-each-other. And in that respect, they're not like real summits. But it's the best that the United States has been able to get the Chinese to agree to and as I said, it's certainly better than a mere telephone call. Now, the United States and China have each provided accounts of what they're looking for from this meeting. And there was, interestingly enough, a telephone conversation between the two top foreign policy officials of the two governments, Antony Blinken, Secretary of State, and Wang Yi, the Foreign Minister of the People's Republic of China. 
And we've had some readouts. We've had readouts from both sides as to what was discussed. And it's interesting that in both cases, the topic of Taiwan is mentioned in the readouts. Now, I'm going to start with the American readout from the State Department. And like all American readouts, it's extremely short. But this is what it said, says. Secretary of State Antony Blinken spoke on November 12th with PRC State Councillor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi. The Secretary discussed preparations for President Biden's upcoming virtual meeting with President Xi Jinping, noting the meeting presents an opportunity for the two leaders to discuss how to responsibly manage competition between the United States and China while working together in areas where interests align. The Secretary emphasised long-standing US interest in peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait and expressed concern regarding the PRC's continued military, diplomatic and economic pressure against Taiwan. He urged Beijing to engage in meaningful dialogue to resolve cross-strait issues peacefully and in a manner consistent with the wishes and best interests of the people on Taiwan. The Secretary also stressed the importance of taking measures to ensure global energy supply and price volatility do not imperil global economic recovery. It's an interesting last sentence, given that China is, of course, an energy importer rather than an exporter. It shows the extent to which the administration is becoming seriously concerned by the worldwide inflation crisis and is now anxiously talking to all governments about it, including the government of China, which is, of course, a major energy importer, with the United States worried about the fact that China's um, unlimited, or so it seems, demand for energy is, placing, is causing energy prices is one factor causing energy prices to spike. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say about that. That is Blink that is the US State Department's account of what Blinken said. And I'm going to just home in on two sentences and one particular uh, uh, what what they say what they say. And Blinken talks about or at least the State Department says Blinken talked about the need for the two countries to responsibly manage competition between the United States and China whilst working together in areas where interests align. This is, of course, the concept of foreign policy a la carte, the United States getting from China help on those issues which concern the United States, and the United States competing with China on everything else, including those issues which are of interest to China. And the Chinese have consistently rejected this. They said that's not acceptable. They say that you can't run foreign policy between China and the United States in that sort of way. The United States needs to take heed of China's concerns and the issue that is at the top of China's concerns is the one that, of course, comes up in the next sentence. And we learn that uh, uh, Blinken emphasised long-standing US interests in peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait and expressed concern regarding China's continued military, diplomatic and economic pressure on Taiwan. He urged China to engage in meaningful dialogue to resolve cross-strait issues peacefully and a manner in a manner consistent with the wishes and best interests of the people on Taiwan. Now, actually, believe it or not, that is, from a US perspective, almost a conciliatory comment. Note, for example, that Blinken refers to the, be the wishes and best interests of the people on Taiwan as opposed to the people of Taiwan. Uh, of Taiwan, 
might imply that Taiwan is an independent state. On Taiwan concedes that Taiwan is an island and therefore an island which is a part of China, simply separated from the mainland as a result of historic events, which will one day doubtless be overcome. So this is actually a more careful choice of words from the United States than the one we've seen from the United States on the Taiwan issue for some time. And it's clearly intended to prevent the situation uh, arising where the Chinese feel that the US is being so provocative on the Taiwan issue that they might decide to call the entire summit meeting so laboriously set up that they might decide to call it off. But in other respects, of course, the Chinese will not be happy with what this readout says. I mean, it says that Beijing should engage in meaningful dialogue to resolve cross-strait issues peacefully. Doesn't say that Taipei, the authorities in Taiwan, in, either, in other words, should engage in meaningful dialogue with Beijing. There's no, there's no suggestion that there is a responsibility on Taiwan or on the authorities of Taiwan to do the same. The point about is resolving issues peacefully, of course, appears to suggest that it is China that is acting aggressively and which is threatening the position, the peaceful situation on the Taiwan Straits. And that, of course, is something which the Chinese categorically reject as far as they're concerned. It is the secessionist moves of the present authorities in Taiwan, backed by the United States, that are the entire source of the tension. So, in, in a way, though Blinken is trying to be conciliatory, he can't go all the way and say straightforwardly that the United States understands that Taiwan is an important issue for China and that the United States does not intend to interfere or concern itself with it and recognises China's red lines over Taiwan. We see nothing like that. We see instead these comments which appear to put all the burden and all the blame for the tension on Beijing whilst giving Taiwan and the government of Taiwan, which is quite openly now pursuing a secessionist agenda, giving it an absolute free run. So that is not going to please the Chinese. And in fact, we can say that he didn't because, of course, the Chinese have provided their own much more extensive readout of the conversation between Blinken and their foreign minister, Wang Yi. And this is what the Chinese readout says. On November 13th, 2021, State Councillor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi spoke on the phone with US Secretary of State Antony J. Blinken at the latter's request. Now, I've discussed this many times about how readouts which make a point of identifying which party sought the call are a way of showing that the country that's publishing the readout is in a superior position. It is the other side that is acting like a kind of supplicant. The Chinese have been very careful on this instance to point out that it was Blinken, the United States, that has asked for this call. It is the Chinese, in other words, who are sitting back, listening intently to what the Americans are saying. It is the Chinese, in effect, who are in the superior position. And just as it was the United States that pressed for this meeting with Blink, with, uh, between Biden and uh, Xi, so it is the, the United States which continues to push for uh, the agenda for this summit meeting. And it is the Chinese who are listening and listening carefully to what the Americans are saying. 
And then we go ahead and we read what was uh, said, uh, what the Chinese say, Wang Yi said to Blinken. And it was as follows. Wang Yi said that President Xi Jinping will hold a virtual meeting with President Biden on November 16th. The meet, this meeting, keenly followed by the whole world, is of great significance, not just for China-US relations, but also for international relations. It is the shared hope of the two peoples and the international community that the meeting will yield outcomes beneficial to both countries and the world. The helmanship of the two heads of state plays a key role in steering bilateral relations. By the way, just for uh, in parenthesis, that's another example. There's increasing numbers of them of the Chinese uh, uh, um, bringing back some of the language of the Maoist era. Whether this is intentional or not, I'm not sure. But of course, Mao Zedong, when he was chairman and leader of the People's Republic of China, was often referred to in the Chinese media uh, at that time as the great helmsman. So here we see Wang Yi using the same language to describe Xi Jinping and Blinken as they steer the ships of state of the United States and China. Anyway, to continue, the two sides should work in the same direction and make every preparation to ensure a smooth and successful meeting and bring bilateral relations back onto the track of sound and steady development. Now, I have to say, to me, that sentence looks like a teacher ticking off a naughty schoolboy. What Wang Yi is saying is that you, the Americans, have messed things up badly with us. You've behaved in a bat in, in an unfortunate way. You've said things about us which you shouldn't have done. You've said things about Taiwan which you shouldn't have done. We'll come to that in a moment. And as a result, you have a responsibility to to work hard to ensure a smooth and successful meeting to bring re bilateral relations back onto the track of sound and steady development. Now, sound and steady development frankly sounds very much like development progress Chinese style rather than American. In other words, it is the responsibility of the United States to correct its errors as the Chinese would say, repair its relations with China, and then at that point, everything will be back to normal, and the stability in this in critical relationship will be restored, and that will be good not just for the Chinese and American people, but for the international community generally, and for peace and stability across the world. So in effect... Um, Wang Yi is, as we say in England, ticking Anthony Blinken off. He's saying it's your fault. You now need to work hard to persuade us that things are going to go back on track. That's essentially what he's saying. Then the next paragraph, which gives us what Blinken is supposed to have said in response. Blinken said the world is following closely the virtual meeting between the US and Chinese heads of state. Both sides have made full preparation and are making progress. The US side looks forward to sharing views on bilateral ties with the Chinese side during the meeting in the spirit of mutual respect and jointly send a strong message to the world. Now, that's slightly different from what the Americans put it, how the Americans put it. According to the Americans, according to the American readout, uh, Blinken said that the uh, uh, meeting presents an opportunity for the two leaders to discuss how to responsibly manage competition between the United States and China whilst working together in areas where interests align. And I've already explained why how that looks to me very much a demand or rather a, a uh, further a, a suggestion that things should follow the American playbook of foreign of diplomacy a la carte. China helps the United States, 
on those things that are of concern to the United States. And there is competition on all other issues, including those which concern China. The Chinese, by contrast, put it rather differently. They say that, in, that uh, Blinken said uh, that um, the United States uh, uh, looks forward to sharing views on bilateral ties with the Chinese side during the meeting in the spirit of mutual respect and jointly sending a strong message to the world. That's much more conciliatory than the Amer American readout reads us to think. Without a transcript of what actually the two said to each other, it's impossible to say which readout is the more accurate one. But for um, my, but just to say my own opinion here, I think the Chinese one probably is, because given that it's the Americans who are asking for this summit meeting, I think the Americans, Blinken, will have been very careful in his choice of words not to say something which might offend the Chinese and lead them to call off the summit. Consider how, as I said, even the Amer American readout refers to the people on Taiwan as opposed to the people of Taiwan. Anyway, we now come to the issue that the Chinese are really concerned about. And it's Taiwan. And here again, the contrast with what the American, say, the American readout says is extremely interesting. In response to the US's recent wrong words and deeds on the Taiwan question, Wang Yi further elaborated on China's solemn position. Wang Yi said, both history and reality has fully proven that Taiwan independence is the biggest threat to peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. Any connivance of and support for the Taiwan independence forces undermines peace across the Taiwan Strait and would only boomerang in the end. Wang Yi noted, if the United States truly wants to safeguard peace across the Taiwan Straits, then it should clearly and resolutely oppose any Taiwan independence moves, abide by the solemn commitments it made in the three China-US joint communiques, and put the one China policy into action, and stop sending wrong signals to the Taiwan independence forces. Well, that's pretty clear. We're not to blame. We're not the cause of the tension. We're not the people who are taking the aggressive moves. It's the Taiwanese secessionists are, and you're making things worse by supporting them and encouraging them. And whilst you do that, there will be no peace and stability on the Taiwan Straits, and any attempt to move forward and to improve relations constructively between the United States and China will fail and will go nowhere. That's essentially what Wang Yi said. And then very interestingly, we have his response to Blinken's comments about energy issues. The two sides also exchange views on issues including energy security, climate change and the Iranian nuclear issue and agree to maintain dialogue on responding to all kinds of global challenges. So Wang Yi heard what Blinken had to say, but refused to commit himself or China on any of those issues. Well, that's where it stands as far as the readouts are concerned. It looks as if from the readouts that the Chinese, Wang Yi, read out a lecture to Blinken about who is responsible for the deterioration in relations between China and the US. And he made it very clear that it is the US and that Wang Yi also made it very clear that Taiwan is the key issue. Provided the, the situation in Taiwan um, remains stable, in other words, provided Taiwan does not make take any step towards 
declaring itself independent or towards outright secession, and provided the United States stops encouraging such moves, then it's possible that US-China relations will eventually get back on track. But if the United States continues to uh, uh, support secessionist moves by Taiwan, if the Taiwanese authorities continue to pursue those kind of secessionist moves, then tension on the Taiwan Straits will continue and will, if anything, grow. There might very well be a conflict. And in that case, needless to say, US and China relations will go down the tubes. There will be a crisis which I suspect will make even the Cuban Missile Crisis look small. Anyway, that's what Wang Yi said to Blinken. And if you read the much more informative Chinese readout and you compare it with the US readout, you can see you can see what the nature of the exchange. Well, as is always done with China, as the Chinese so helpfully do, they've actually provided us via Global Times with a commentary around these readouts. And there they explain the position clearly and directly. And the commentary is in the form of a typical Global Times editorial. And it zones, zones in on the question of Taiwan. The title of the editorial is Suppressing Taiwan Secession Together, Key for China-US to Manage Competition. In other words, it's Taiwan that is the single most important issue in US-China relations. And unless this is solved according to Chinese desires, in other words, unless the whole drive towards independence and secession in Taiwan is called off, and, a sole, uh, and unless the United States drops its support for uh, independence and secession by Taiwan, unless those things happen, US-China relations will continue to deteriorate. And now let's go and read what the editorial, which is not long by Global Times standards, says. And it says the following. Chinese State Councillor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi on Saturday spoke with US Secretary of State Antony Blinken on the phone as both sides prepare for a virtual meeting between Chinese President Xi Jinping and US President Joe Biden scheduled for November 16th Beijing time. The announcement of the foreign minister's talks in, issued by China and the US both highlighted the Taiwan question. But there is a huge gap between their views. It is expected that the virtual meeting between the two heads of state will also give an important place to the Taiwan question, which will be one of the biggest difficulties of the meeting. The US noted in recent days that the, their expectation for the Chinese-US video summit is to responsibly manage the competition between the United States and China. However, in order to manage the competition between the US and China, the most critical and urgent thing is to diffuse the explosive question concerning Taiwan. Those are Global Times words, not mine. Because the Taiwan Straits is the most likely flashpoint to trigger the confrontation between China and the US. Blinken's call for the Chinese mainland to engage in meaningful dialogue to resolve cross-strait issues peacefully and in a manner consistent with the wishes and best interests of the people on Taiwan is hypocritical cliché and nonsense. After the Democratic Progressive Party came to power again in 2016, it immediately abandoned the 1992 consensus and never mentioned the one China principle after that. 
promoting Taiwan's secession has become their explicit goal. However, the US did not stop the DPP authorities' risky actions, but encouraged them and then asked the Chinese mainland to adhere to the peaceful way to deal with the crisis across the straits. Does it make any sense? Yes, the Chinese mainland has been stepping up its preparations for a military conflict across the Taiwan Straits in recent years. Apart from making the Taiwan authorities aware that the risk of war is approaching them, is there any language in the world that can help them understand what, the, the, what they're doing is extremely dangerous? To stabilise the cross-strait situation, the only way is to ease confrontation politically and rebuild the political foundation for peaceful coexistence and discussion of the future between the two sides. The US should play a constructive role in changing the extreme path of the DPP authority. Without the minimum level of political mutual trust, can China and the United States make it clear by arguing over what should be done across the Taiwan Straits and who bears a larger responsibility? Is there any meaning in such a discussion? The US has pursued the Indo-Pacific strategy with the main purpose of containing China and played the Taiwan card against China. The Taiwan authorities have completely inclined to the US openly claiming that they serve as the front line of democracy against authoritarianism. The US wants the Chinese mainland to tolerate such authorities on the island. What moral authority do they have to persuade China to do so? The Taiwan question is the ultimate red line of China. In order to risk to reduce the risk of, strategic, of a strategic collision between China and the United States. The latter must take a step back from the Taiwan question and show its restraint. The US is targeting China's core interests, causing fundamental tensions in bilateral relations. Washington must understand that it has gone too far, leaving China with no way back. It also needs to see that it is the only one that should take a step back to keep the forces between China and the US at a safe distance. The US has recently begun to hype the issue of Taiwan's participation in the United Nations. It has openly done some salami slicing that could be seen as the US to restore its military presence in Taiwan. As news about military cooperation between Washington and the, and the island continues to emerge, how come this is only a competition? We cannot understand what the US side is doing, whilst at the same time it is preaching about preventing the China-US competition from escalating into conflict. We increasingly feel that trying to figure out Washington's logic is a waste of time and that force seems to work better than reasoning with the US side. China is willing to work with the US to reduce the risks in the situation in the Taiwan Straits, but history tells us that the only thing the United States really cares about is talks through strength. China will have to fight and have a dialogue with the US at the same time. We hope that the US will participate in the video summit with some sincerity and that it will promote the solution to the problems to ease the highly tense China-US relations instead of putting the priority on getting tough on China to satisfy such a need in US society. The whole world is now worried about the further deterioration of China-US relations, and the key to turning the situation round is to change the US's belligerent policy towards China. Well, that spells it out absolutely clearly. If the United States wants a long-term, stable, 
peaceful relationship with Russia, with China, one which involves responsibly managing the competition between the two. It needs to respect China's red lines. For China, the red line is independence for Taiwan. If the United States continues to support the drive by the Taiwanese authorities for secession from China, then there will be a confrontation with China. And that confrontation could escalate into a military conflict and the United States will have brought that about because of its inability to recognise and acknowledge and support China's red lines. And if the United States gets drawn into that conflict, well, the Chinese will push back and fight hard, and they've made that absolutely clear. All the indications are that that is what Xi Jinping is going to tell Biden on the 16th of November. It seems to me that the United States once again is going to find itself faced with the Chinese, with Xi Jinping, when it, Biden speaks to Xi Jinping, up against the same Chinese position that all the other officials who have gone to China and have talked to Chinese officials have faced, which is the implacable Chinese position on Taiwan. Now, where are we when we look at all of this? Well, the first point to say is that the Chinese do believe, and I think that this is the reason why they've agreed to this summit meeting, that there are uncertainties or disputes about uh, China and about the situation between um, China and the United States, and that there are some people, some forces within the United States who might actually be interested in a general stabilization of the situation between the United States and China. And the Chinese are going to try and use this summit meeting with Biden to explore the extent to which this is possible. And another article in Global Times has this rather interesting comment in a rather long paragraph, a rather long article which discusses the prospective summit. And it says the following. There are two elite groups in the United States holding different opinions on China policy, including the hardline faction that advocates playing the Taiwan card and the other faction represented by Wall Street elites who expect to restore economic ties between the China and the US. In fact, this high-level meeting is being held in order to send a message from the White House to comfort business and financial elites. So the Chinese think that there might still be some people in the United States for, who, for economic reasons, might be amenable to discussion but they also recognise that there are hardliners, like, by the way, Blinken and Jake Sullivan, who are completely unreasonable on these issues, who see things in purely ideological terms and who can't therefore be negotiated with or spoken to. And remember, um, go, if we go back to that discussion, that editorial in Global Times, it's striking that, that there was that extraordinarily striking phrase about what is the, um, uh, without the minimum level of political mutual trust, can China and the US make it clear by arguing over what should be done about across the Taiwan Straits and who bears a larger responsibility? Is there any meaning in such a discussion? In other words, if you're talking to us in an ideological sense, well, there's no point in holding a discussion, but perhaps there might be some people in the United States, people focused on the Wall Street elites, who might be interested in some kind of restoration of a stable relationship with China and who might therefore be willing to acknowledge the Chinese red lines over Taiwan. We shall see. But 
the Chinese have made their position very clear and they're clearly not prepared to deviate from it in any way. Now, I'm going to here venture my own view. I think any Chinese hopes on the Wall Street elites, which, by the way, um, um, I don't think they have very high hopes about those Wall Street elites, but there we are. Any hopes that there are conciliatory forces in the United States seeking to improve relations in China and that those realist forces will prevail, I think that those hopes are almost certainly not going to be fulfilled. With US relations with China, as with US relations with Russia, we see the same problem. The US understands that in both cases it has a problem. It understands that it is now in a situation of great power competition. It's no longer a unipolar world. It's a world which the United States has to share with two other great powers, China and Russia. And the United States also understands that managing that sort of a world is far more difficult, certainly than the unipolar world, which has just passed, and also that bipolar world, the world of the Cold War, when there were just two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, facing off against each other. So the United States understands that. But at the same time, for ideological reasons, it finds it impossible to concede that these great powers have red lines and will enforce those great red lines across against the United States. Always and invariably, the United States talks to these, the leaders of these great powers as if it is looking for compromise but always, and in the end, falls short from doing so. Invariably, it ends up reinstating, reinstating that same hardline position that it always followed. So the Russians have repeatedly told the United States that Ukraine is the major obstacle in improving relations between Russia and the United States, the Russians have repeatedly told the United States that there is a roadmap to sort out the problem of Ukraine, and that is the Minsk Agreement, which the United States accepted when it allowed, when it didn't exercise its veto against the Minsk Agreement, when the Minsk Agreement was put to the UN Security Council and, became a re and, and was converted into a resolution of the Security Council and a part of international law. And the Russians have repeatedly said that the way forward, therefore, is for the United States to tell the authorities in Kiev, the government of Ukraine, to do what they are required to do by the Minsk Agreement, which is sit down and talk with the two breakaway republics of the Donbass to agree a new political settlement, a new constitution, and to go forward and hold elections in Ukraine to set up a national unity government. That's what the Russians repeatedly say to the US, and they say that so long as if the United States does that, if it acknowledges Russia's red lines, if it settles the crisis in Ukraine in that way, it, if it forswears any intention of pulling Ukraine into NATO and ultimately the European Union also, then there is no reason why relations between Russia and the United States should not go back on track. And the Chinese, with respect to Taiwan, are saying essentially the same thing. They're saying to the United States, well, you've agreed to the One China policy, you say you adhere to the One China policy, just as, by the way, you say you adhere to the Minsk Agreement, which settles the conflict in Ukraine. All you need to do, therefore, is to act according to what you've previously committed yourself to and tell the people in Taiwan that if they pursue secession, they are not got the backing of the United States and that the United States does not regard Taiwan as a military ally and is not seeking 
to engineer the breakaway of Taiwan from China. And if you do that, well, then we can do all the things that you talk about. We can go back to a peaceful and stable relationship. The major flashpoint in our relations will have been sorted and we can proceed then to manage that competition which you talk about in that reasonable and stable and predictable way that you speak of. And that's what the Chinese are saying. That's in relation to Ukraine what the Russians are saying. And there doesn't seem to be any ability in the United States to accept that message. Uh, Putin made that those very same points, as we know, to Biden at that summit meeting which took place in June in Geneva, and nothing came of it. And Xi Jinping is going to make those same points to Biden at the summit meeting that's going to take place on the 16th of November. And it's doubtful that anything will come of that either. The reason in both cases is that though there are undoubtedly some people in the political system in the United States who grasp the danger of the situation for the United States, the long-term danger of getting drawn into a crisis in Ukraine with Russia and a crisis in Ukraine, in China, with, with China over Taiwan, though there are some people who understand that, they are unable to prevail over the hardliners in the Washington bureaucracy, and they are unable also to prevail with the hardliners in Congress, where neocompositions near are now all but universally held. And given that this is so, it seems to me that one could say that much like that June summit, which took place between Putin and Biden, which was supposed to lead to a predictable and stable relationship between China, between the between the United States and Russia. So this summit meeting, this virtual summit meeting between Biden and Xi Jinping is going to fail in exactly the same way. It too is going to end uh, being no more than a punctuation mark as relations between the U US and China continue to deteriorate primarily over the issue of Taiwan. Look where we are with Russia. Back in June, as I said, Biden was seeking a summit meeting with Putin and trying to get things, trying to negotiate and get things on a predictable and stable track with Putin. Putin explained to Biden that in order for that to happen, there needed to be some movement over the Ukraine issue. There has been no movement over the Ukraine issue. The crisis in Ukraine, as a result, is getting deeper. And American, American officials, Victoria Nuland first, and William Burns II have been to Moscow and have found themselves in very uncomfortable meetings there. And once again, we are back in a situation where the United States claims to be worried about Ukraine and is talking about a possible war there, perhaps in January. So that meeting between Biden and Putin has achieved nothing. And it seems to me that we're going to be in exactly the same situation with Biden uh, after the Biden and Xi uh, meeting over Taiwan. The Chinese, Xi Jinping, will again spell it all out for Biden. Biden will pretend to listen. Nothing, however, will be done. And in a few weeks or months' time, we will see the situation take another spiral down. Professor Brennan, who is, as I, as I understand, a professor of international re relations at Pittsburgh University, says that the United States is so blind at the moment to the realities of the international situation, so incapable of seeing things 
from the perspective of the other side that it will need an event like a, the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 to bring it down to earth and to get it to accept that the other sides have red lines and that those have to be respected. Well, I hope it doesn't come to that. And to be straightforward about it, if it does, I'm far from confident that it will be managed in the same effective way that John F. Kennedy managed the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. But this latest exchange between Blinken and Wang Yi makes me think that it will probably indeed take something like that to happen before we do indeed move towards that predictable and stable world which is there for the taking, but which the neocon tendency in the United States seems unable to get us to. Well, thank you very much for joining me for this programme today. I look forward to you joining me in future programmes on this channel. Please also check us out on our main channel, The Duran, where I do programmes with my colleague and friend Alex Christoforou. Please also remember to check out Alex's channel. you find links under this video. Please also um, remember to check us out on our other platforms, especially locals. I should say that I'm planning to do a further, another live stream on locals on Wednesday. If you want to have a direct dialogue with me, you can join us on locals and participate in that live stream. Besides, we have lots of exclusive content, which you will also find appearing on locals at the moment. And you can also, of course, if you want, publish content of your, uh, of your own on locals on our locals platform. Many of our members do precisely that. And you are, we're also, of course, on other, um, on other platforms, on BitChute, Library, Rumble, Odyssey, and all the rest. And you can support us via Patreon and Subscribestar. And you can support us by going to our shop, buying all the amazing things that you will find there, our magic mugs, our, our hats, mm -hmm. our hoodies, our T-shirts, our sweatshirts, and all the rest. Thank you again for joining me today for this programme. I look forward to you joining me again soon. And please remember to check your subscription to this channel and to press the like button if you like this video. And thank you again for joining me. And I look forward to you joining me soon. And have a wonderful day. Until then.